There you go, maybe, maybe. So a little bit about me. Um, as Jason alluded to, I was very, very deep in the security community. Um, I ran Microsoft's fuzzing strategy and toolkit for about three years. Uh, was at the point where I knew everybody in the community. I did some interesting things there. Uh, a little project called Bang Exploitable is one that I released to, for everyone to have, kind of an open source project uh, to do some crash analysis work together with Dave Weinstein. Um, and this community, the security community, is really where my heart is. It's what I've been doing for a, a very, very long time, um, since I was uh, probably too young to really have been doing it. And actually, I remember the moment um, I was uh, hacking into a BBS. This was in the early 90s. And for anybody who did BBSs, you'll remember some of these old like WW4 terminals, the software that would have hosted, kind of the pre-internet days. And there was a really great escape sequence where you could get out to this hidden root account. And I used to use it to just trash my friends in some of these games that we played, um, where I'd have like, you know, hours and hours and hours of playtime, and I'd just totally thrash them. Uh, but I was watching CNN while I was doing this, and uh, Newt Gingrich, Bill Clinton came on, talked about this telecommunications act. And I realized what I was doing at that point was about to become illegal and had a, uh, a bit of a reconciling with that at a young age. Uh, my father being a police officer in the city that I grew up in, I realized that were I to be arrested, they'd probably throw me in the room, shut the door, and deny that they heard anything. Um, but I came back to it. I, I spent a couple of years living in the Ukraine, and I saw some very, very interesting things in the security space when I lived there. That was the, the late 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, 96 to 98. And it kind of rekindled my interest, and I got back into this as I got back from the Ukraine and, and went to work for Bell Labs and uh, eventually ended up at Microsoft. But it's been my professional focus for the last decade, uh, really getting into understanding the bugs, finding the bugs, doing penetration testing, doing policy work, really what, what we all do. Um, I tell people that in security, to be effective, you've got to be a mile wide. And then you've also got to have a couple areas where you're a mile deep as opposed to many industries where you need to have some you know, general awareness of a couple of things around you, but your expertise is really what you uh, get paid on. We get paid to be experts of everything, essentially. And I finished some things with fuzzing that I was looking at at Microsoft, and an interesting thing happened. It was a terrible and interesting thing together. I have four children. Uh, my oldest at that time was uh, 15. Uh, she's now 17. But she had a stalker on Facebook. Real guy, uh, neighbor, uh, an uncle to one of the neighbors that she was friends with. And I went about the process of trying to get this guy, like, one, off Facebook, and two, keep my wife from going all Sicilian on him with a baseball bat. <laughs> and in the process of doing this, I realized that the uh, Facebook process for reporting was very unfulfilling. And I had no idea what was actually going to be done. You click the, would click this little link at that point in time, and it's kind of changed now, and you'd submit that, hey, there's this guy, and I think there's this stuff going on, and you clicked, oh, you clicked send, and that was it. There wasn't even like a, we got it. There wasn't a, we'll follow up with you. There was nothing. I was like, well, I, I kind of don't feel okay about that. So I reached out to uh, you know, some guys that I know over at Facebook, because we're all one big happy community, right? We know each other. And I had them do their investigation onto the security side. They went and talked to the fraud guys. They're like, yeah, this guy crossed some lines. And, and they got him kicked off Facebook. And I came out of that thinking, with all of my understanding and knowledge in the security space, I had no ability to protect my family. The controls did not exist to actually keep that data about my daughter controlled in any way, shape, or form. And that I, as a parent, couldn't even see who her friends were unless she gave me the permission to see who all of her friends were. Now, that happened at the same time as the Bing uh, security manager, or privacy manager job came open. I went to uh, the guy who I knew uh, who was hiring for the job. He was a security guy. And I said, Mike, you don't want a privacy manager. He said, I'm hiring a privacy manager. I said, no, no, no. You don't want a privacy manager. You want an engineer. You want someone who's going to help engineer your way out of these privacy problems, because that's really what we need. And that's, that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And I've spent the last two and a half years, actually, now as the privacy manager for Bing. Um, they were gracious enough to give me a couple of people to work for me now to help me out with it, because I was the privacy manager for Bing. 
But I've also taken the two spaces, security and privacy, and I brought them together into one. And so I'm running the lead for the security and privacy team for uh, OSD. When I went to make this switch, there was some concern. People thought I had lost myself and was on a vision quest or something. Um, I remember Mike Eddington, uh, who writes Peach, uh, DD, he kind of, you know, he's a big guy like me, and he kind of put his hand on my shoulder and he's like, Jason, I tried talking to these privacy guys once. It lasted six months and I ran screaming. He said, are you really, really sure? And I said, yeah, I'm really sure. Um, because not only did I see the issues for myself and my family being able to protect my own, but I understood also that it, privacy was increasingly becoming a problem for technology. And as we moved into the cloud, as we moved into social networking, and as we moved into these spaces, it was going to be much, much more of a problem. And as security, we're the guys who like work on a lot of the controls to fix this stuff. And actually, I think we're one of the only groups with the right understanding and knowledge to be able to solve some of these problems. So we have this, a lot of things that are happening right now in the uh, technology area. We've got our digital persona out there that we're projecting. And we've got, uh, you know, that's kind of who we are. We've been doing that in email and IM and chat rooms and whatever. And maybe in a chat room, it would be okay for me to wear a skirt, because who knows, right? Um, but then it's all coming together with physical location and data about you know, everything that I'm doing. We've got all this uh, metadata now that they're talking about with the NSA and what does metadata mean, right? And it's all in our pocket. Everybody's got a mobile device. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to a third world country lately, but you can see children literally digging for trash, uh, through the trash for dinner, and they'll have an iPhone knockoff. So even though they don't have shoes or food to eat, they still have a mobile, a mobile device. And that we've actually got data that shows that in Africa, as an example, as we give this technology to cassava root farmers, they can triple their annual incomes just by understanding where the best prices are today for selling the roots. And so we're seeing this mass scale out of all of these things, and there's huge opportunity um, we're talking about, literally, as I say here in the slides, hundreds of billions of dollars of new markets that are going to be produced by this confluence of data in this new world. And as we move from 2 billion people online, it's about where we are today, to by the end of this decade, we'll probably be looking closer to 5 or 7 billion people online. It kind of depends on how quickly Africa and parts of Central Asia and things pick it up. But that is that is an enormous amount of data that's new from a group of people who didn't grow up like many of us or maybe our children are now with the data, uh, with technology. Now, we all know um, when you have lots of data, there's good that can happen, but we like to do a little bad too, right? We get that, uh, that, that desire to make bad things happen and that's what we all try to kind of stop in the security community or maybe we don't try to stop depending on what side we're on. But we've got some players out there in the technology space that are maybe a little edgy. Now, I'm not poking fun at any of my competitors here. Um, this just so happens that a couple of uh, Microsoft's competitors, well, one of my competitors comes up in this commercial, but uh, it's to illustrate a point of what this new technology really can do for us. Brad and I just had the best first date. I think he's the one. And now, with my Android-powered phone from Virgin Mobile, I can email the pics I took to my mom. And with unlimited data and web, I can go through this worksheet to make sure I'm not having access to the public's Twitter feed. yet, I can even watch his four square check-ins for patterns. It's only $25 a month. That's crazy, right? And another one. Brad loves to keep me on my toes. I've sent him tons of texts tonight, and he hasn't responded. I know he's home. But with unlimited data and web on my Android-powered phone from Virgin Mobile, I've got tons to do while I wait. Bruce, his flicker stream, checking on Foursquare. Oh my gosh, I'm mayor of Brad's closet. It's only $25 a month. That's crazy, right? Ew. Creepy. My favorite line there, by the way, is, oh my gosh, I'm the mayor of Brad's closet. 
right? That's awesome. But essentially, they're showing, to show off their feature set, they're saying, hey, look what a great stalker you can be. This is so fantastic. And it's true that we're really uh, looking at that kind of technology in our pockets, and as people get access to that data, they could follow everything that we do, and there's a lot of concern around that. Because there's a lot of concern around that, people are noticing that that's happening. So here we have Senator Al Franken. I still remember him from his uh, Saturday Night Live days. Um, but he's done a very good job of being taken very seriously at this point. And he particularly is taking up as his main issue as a senator, digital privacy. And here's a quote from him that I think really sums up where we are today. But I think there's a balance, a balance we need to strike. And this means we're beginning to change the way we think about privacy to account for the massive shift of our personal information into the hands of the private sector because the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to corporations. The Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply to Silicon Valley. So I want you to think about that for just a moment. Essentially what Senator Franken is telling us here is that individuals have little to no recourse in the case that their data is stolen or trodden upon by companies, or they feel that it's stolen. Freedom of Information Act gives individuals, corporations, whatever, the ability to go and uh, petition the federal government for information about something that happened. Uh, you can ask for information about yourself, about you know, things that you might be interested in, 911 tapes of you know, whatever happened. And, uh, and so you, there's some recourse, right? And the Fourth Amendment is what that's trying to protect. The Fourth Amendment is uh, reasonable search and seizure, which uh, says that the government can't just walk into your house and take you for absolutely no reason. Maybe Patriot Act aside, maybe not, right? Uh, but in technology, the recourse is not there and the protections are not there. But why is this our problem in this room? Why is it a security problem? The landscape is changing dramatically. We're looking at laws that prohibit pulling data from countries, backhauling data from one place to another. Um, <laughs> technically, taking information from Europe and bringing it to the United States would be a violation, unless there were the safe harbor agreement that we've got below. It's illegal to exfiltrate data about Chinese citizens from China. What does that mean for you know, any company dealing with technology at all? If you have a website and you have Chinese users, right, does that put you at risk? Are there problems there? Um, India just passed a bunch of laws that are pretty broad and sweeping uh, in the last uh, year or so. And we do have some of these agreements that allow us to bring the data back. But the penalties for these things, oh, all right, now I know you've all been Sony'd to death, right? So we're gonna kind of jump through these couple of slides here. I pulled this together from another presentation a little bit. Um, why did people care about Sony being attacked though? We all know that there were a lot of breakdowns that happened for Sony to be played the way that they were. And there was kind of some activism that was involved, right? They went after this kid who uh, rooted the PlayStation uh, 3 and Sony didn't like that and so they sued him and so Anonymous said Sony screw you and just hacked and hacked and hacked and hacked the crap out of them. The reason people cared though is because they were losing data. That's what we're protecting. That's why we're involved in this is we're keeping access to data uh, kind of controlled. More than that though, the penalties are going up at a crazy rate. Google was fined $22.5 million uh, just last year for knowingly and willfully bypassing a measure in Safari for privacy. Now, they'd argue whether or not it was uh, knowingly, the FTC said it was, right? And they levied a fine. The biggest fine ever levied by the FTC, um, made up, people have done the calculations that are online, about eight minutes of search advertising that was done, right? And so in the European Union, and this wasn't uh, last week, this was a little further back, a US judge in California approved a settlement against Facebook for 20 million. So we've got these multiple tens of millions of dollars now. These are the first time that we're really seeing these kind of damages being awarded 
But in the European Union, they're saying this is a slap on the wrist for multi-billion dollar multinational companies. So they've now got in the European directive um, the ability for member states to fine up to 2% of gross domestic revenues for a company for a single privacy infraction. And theoretically, that could be applied for every member state in the EU. I'm talking about a single event that could make multi-billion dollar international companies go out of business. And it's a security problem. We're actually mischaracterizing, I believe, privacy and security. We're not really talking about privacy and security. We're talking about risk. And when you're talking about risk, you have several sides to it. You have policy and you have engineering. For the most part, in privacy, you have policy people, lawyers. I know I speak to lots of them. My lawyers are very important for me in my role as a privacy manager, as well as the other privacy managers around Microsoft. There are about 400 people working on just privacy at Microsoft. But most of them have understanding or degrees in and around law and policy. On the security side, though, we're mostly engineers. We're ones and zeros, we're hex, we're compilers. We talk about how to resolve problems. We talk about, like in the fuzzing space, how to go and find problems on a massive scale. And it's this legalese versus techno babble kind of in injunction that we hit. We, we can't communicate very well. Because, well, lawyers don't understand our techno babble, and we have very little tolerance for legalese. Right? So we kind of shut down and don't listen so well. But on the other hand, and I can tell you this because I went in there, the privacy expertise that you have, or the security expertise that you have and that you carry, is a big stick in the privacy world. As a security expert, when you hear a privacy conversation and you think you should contribute, I'm telling you, you should, because you're more of an expert than you think you are. So how many people here have thoughts and beliefs around like First Amendment freedom of speech stuff that are really ingrained, right? I certainly do. Second Amendment, absolutely. I'm there. Fourth Amendment, for sure. All of them, as a matter of fact. But we tend to get really passionate about some of those, right? Those are what the privacy community are trying to protect, are those kinds of constitutional rights. And we're the engineers that can help them do it. When we offer up solutions, they will try to implement them. And by the way, there's billions of dollars just sitting out there waiting for privacy solutions that are reasonable. So I took after about a year doing this privacy thing um, and wrote out kind of how I look at this from a code level, right? Because the first thing you want to do is define a problem if you're actually going to go about trying to fix it. For me, in online services at Microsoft, which is Bing, MSN, and advertising, data is the lifeblood of the business. Without data, we die. If there is no privacy, consumers don't trust us, and they don't give us data, business goes away, right? These are absolutes. The privacy execution ability today is less than the privacy needs today, which is less than the privacy needs tomorrow. Everything's moving to the cloud. Everything's going managed. And whether you're talking Java or uh, C Sharp, it's all moving to managed. In fact, a lot of uh, respectable computer science programs don't even teach C and C++ at this point. They teach Java and C Sharp. And a developer is not and should not be, or should not be required to be, a privacy expert. So that means that we have some other, um, some other things that we have to consider. So if we look at how we want to start solving this problem, right, we, we have to look at the, these definitions. Uh, the main body that I've seen uh, kind of internationally that really knows what it's talking about in privacy is the International Association of Privacy Professional. Trevor, uh, Trevor Hughes is the president. Um, he goes and he gives this talk that's really interesting, and he says that there are 11 different definitions of privacy. 
Anonymity is the one that most people in the security community think about initially when they go in. Uh, like the confidentiality, right, uh, is another one, the CIA model. But if you have something that people understand 11 different ways, it's really difficult to start to try and tackle that problem at all. And if we go to the dictionary, it's not that much more helpful. We've got quality of state of being apart from a company or observation, seclusion. So do things in dark places or whatever. Freedom from unauthorized intrusion. That's a right to privacy. So it's being talked about here as a right. We'll talk about that in a moment. A place of seclusion, secrecy, a private matter, a secret. And, and so we, we see that even here we have these, you know, there's this, this idea of intrusion, there's being uh, outside of observation, and, and there's this word, a right. Now, privacy is also very different as we go from country to country and as we go from culture to culture. Um, those first, second, fourth amendment rights that I was talking about for Americans that most of us feel very, very strongly over. Um, when you move to Europe, those privacy is one of those rights. They look at privacy as a fundamental human dignity. The same way that we view the First Amendment, the freedoms of speech, Europeans largely view data privacy, their ability to control data about themselves going to other places. Now, there's very good reasons for this. Um, I was having a good conversation outside yesterday about this, and it was pointed out, and it's true, America is a rather young country. We've been at this for a couple of hundred years. Um, in Europe, those countries have been at it, some of them a shorter time than us, but uh, most of them have been at this for uh, hun many more hundreds, if not over a thousand years for uh, some particular areas. And we can see violations of privacy in the past. Um, there's kind of a canonical example that's used in the privacy community of uh, the atrocities that happened in World War II. Uh, the Netherlands had a very, very uh, tight understanding of where people lived and what their ethnicities were. And if you look across Europe, uh, the Holocaust was, uh, they, they put it in percentages, it was more effective than it was even in Nazi Germany where they're looking at an 80 plus percent uh, extermination rate, which is awful, as opposed to the rates that they had in Germany, which were much lower. Because the government understood more about the people, who they were and where they lived. Therefore, Germany actually is kind of this epicenter of uh, pri the privacy world, and for very good reasons. When you have loss of life and when you have terrible events like that, it tends to uh, stick in the memory. So the first thing that you actually need to, to start thinking about this as a, as a security person is a language lesson. Um, and I'm gonna put some, uh, some eye charts up here. We have personally identifiable information that's, or personal data in Europe. That's data that allows for a data subject to be tied to a real human being. Um, then we've also got prominent consent. And sorry, I'm just looking at my time here. All right, uh, prominent consent is uh, the consent that a user is given to collect data, end user license agreements, privacy statement, retention requirements, and actually, you know what? You don't have to be experts in any of this. It's all pretty basic. It's all pretty logical. Then there's the enforcers. These are the people who make sure that companies are doing the right things with data. We've got the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, Article 29 Working Party in Europe, so the way that uh, legislation happens in, uh, in the European Union is very different than the way that legislation happens in the United States. They have the European Union which creates a directive that says here is a base principle that must be incorporated into your country's laws by X date. And then every country goes off and they, um, they work to make those, uh, those laws part of, their, um, uh, part of their country's codex. Um, what's interesting about this is Article 29 is the European Directive for Data Privacy and Human Rights. Again, we see this follow-up to where this is a fundamental human dignity. This is, and we're getting to this point in the United States as we've seen more of these breaches happen, as people are asking lots of questions about you know, what the NSA is actually doing with the, uh, the Snowden files that came out and things like this. We have data protection authorities. Uh, that's kind of a generic term, but it's used largely across Europe. Can Canada has their own privacy commissioner, and there's a lot of these enforcers. 
Actual enforcement, um, there's fines, as we saw, 22 and a half million for Google, 20 million for Facebook. Uh, we're talking real numbers with lots of zeros here, the potential for billions of dollars. Consent decrees. Um, I would actually state that while Google was required to pay $22.5 million, it's probably going to be much more expensive for them over the next 20 years to prove to the FTC that they're doing privacy by design than that $22.5 million. Um, it would be interesting to see a, uh, a cost analysis on that done at some point. I doubt it will ever be released, but it's going to be very expensive, I can tell you that. Uh, Microsoft had one of these consent decrees also, um, expired fairly recently, and we're under another one still right now for uh, Passport that happened about 10 years ago. And then there's injunctions. Um, Google is actually being blocked from implementing their new privacy policy in Europe right now. There's injunctions that are in place where uh, legislators are actually uh, judicial branches are telling technology companies, you can't change. And technology is very fluid. And so if you can't be fluid, you know, what does that mean for your technology? So here's what you should really care about, kind of having a little bit of the background of some of the players, some of the pieces involved, is the translation from security into privacy. We get really tied down in the ones and the zeros sometimes. We see that really elegant overflow. Uh, we, we see the bypass that allows that, uh, that ROP. Um, we, we see these things, and we get excited about them because they're cool and they're fun and you know, they were really hard to find and, and there's a lot of technical know-how and such that went into that and we respect that. But sometimes we need to pull up a little bit, right? On, in security, we talk about these vulnerabilities, we talk about exploits, we talk about payloads. When we go to not just the privacy community, but also execs and the people who write the checks for the work that we do, we can up-level that to talk about the actual consequences, data leakage, unauthorized use, regulatory action. Mitigations. We talk about mitigations and fixes. Um, on the security problem, uh, on the security side, uh, in the, on the privacy side, again, we're largely policy, so we can actually recommend technical mitigations and solutions, and we can bring those to the table in a way that people working on just policy cannot, and automation. Right, my biggest friend is automation. Uh, we're kind of lazy. Uh, it's actually been proven human beings are engineered to be lazy. Uh, that's uh, well, that's kind of what we're built for. If you listen to any of Charlie Miller's fuzzing talks, um, he'll almost always say, "Well, I went and I did this work and I figured it out, and then I was lazy, so I built a fuzzer to like go and find it all for me." Right? Automation is the only way that we can actually accomplish these things with all this data. If you look at just my data set for Bing. Um, we're approaching an exobyte of data. Goes terabyte, petabyte, exobyte. So a million terabytes of data. That's a lot of data. And it's got a lot of stuff there, right? We have a chronological copy of the internet for several years, um, as well as uh, the way that a lot of people have interacted with it. And the only way to manage that data from a technical perspective is a lot of automation. So, I call this buzzword bingo because it is, but these are like actual real problems. Uh, people say big data. I have an exobyte of data. I actually know what that means. Um, but everybody cares, right? Lady Gaga, she wants the rights to her Twitter followers, and Twitter says, no, that's our data, it's not yours. Right? 31 million people we're talking about follow Lady Gaga, and she doesn't get access to who they are without Twitter saying that they can. Uh, the last presidential race came down to who managed their data better. And there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of press around, you know, the Republicans now want to get better about uh, how they're managing the data because the Democrats were way ahead of them. Uh, we saw that with the first Obama campaign as well, that they were just much better about handling their data, and it may have made the difference in who was the president. Also, everything's in the cloud. Um, if you do something online, and I, I hope, and I assume that you all know this, but it's going to be there forever. Anything you do online leaves a footprint, tracks, and it will never go away. And also the on-ramp to the cloud is changing. Uh, in the media and the press, they talk about the post-PC world. What they're really saying isn't that PCs are going to go away. Maybe that's what they think they're saying. 
it doesn't, it's not saying that PCs are going away. It's saying that the primary interface with computers is changing dramatically. And they fit in our pockets, and they have tremendous processing power, and they have lots of memory, and they're always online. And they know where we are, they know what we're doing, they tell us where we should be, when we need to be there, and when we're bored sitting in that doctor's office, they let us play Angry Birds. Right? So they're kind of this technology and best friend in our pocket at the same time. Think what you will about that. Um, and I've got some numbers up here. Uh, 2.4 billion internet users today, and nearly half of that is on mobile devices. To kind of put some, uh, uh, put some scale on that. Uh, there's another presentation that I give where I talk about uh, the change that we've done into, uh, that we've gone through into kind of the mobile world and into the social world. And I'll, I'll steal something from that really quick and, uh, and make a, a, a statement that I think is probably very true. And this is, this is Jason pontificating. Because of the adoption curves that we're seeing on mobile and smart devices and that we're seeing on mobile broadband, it's probably within this decade that we see nearly every human being on the planet capable of making their own decisions, eight, 10 years old plus, will have a mobile device. Think about the ramifications of that. Think about the technical issues that that's going to bring to us. And think about what that means that we're protecting and how we need to protect it. Right? This is why privacy is our problem. We need to implement and create the solutions that are going to enable those people to interact with their computers safely, interact with their mobile devices safely, and store that data in a way that they're going to feel okay about. If anyone watched Deviant's talk yesterday, fantastic talk, by the way, Deviant, very well done. Uh, he was talking about a couple of applications in, that you can use in Android to make your Android device more secure. They were privacy-enabling applications. When we talk about security in the mobile world, yes, there are overflows, yes, there are the technical things, but what most people mean when they say that is they don't control their data. We can fix that. We can take pragmatic security solutions and we can apply them to the, the same areas. Static analysis is an art that we understand that we use. Um, we can take that and apply it to personally identifiable information. I was having a conversation with someone outside. They're like, we're trying to identify all the social security numbers. So we're looking for all patterns of three, two, four numbers, and we're getting 98% junk, right? We can get better than that, though. We can uh, contextually figure out what some of those things are. In transit, data detection is another way to do that. We need some more uh, lightweight encryption mechanisms. Um, one of the... Uh, canonical examples that I personally use uh, when talking about tr taking security solutions and applying them to privacy problems is uh, taking uh, least privilege, right? Well understood, well known concept in our sphere and applying it to big data. So least privilege says you can only access the data that you absolutely need to access to do your job. You control, ACLE it down and make sure that people only have you know, a certain amount of access. On the big data side, well, what if you only collected the data you actually needed, right? I walked into a group of uh, privacy experts and I started talking about this and like, oh my gosh, you're a genius. And as opposed to saying, yes, yes, I know, uh, I was like, no, no, you don't understand, right? This is a solved problem. And this is what I'm saying. We actually have solved problems that, we're, uh, that we can transpose over into the privacy world. And again, there's billions of dollars on the table to solve these things. So as we really look at it, again, the security community is uniquely able to identify and help solve these privacy problems. All we need to do in order to do that is up-level the conversation appropriately and then bring solutions and mitigations to the problem. We've got build tools, uh, and automatic, uh, automate the response and the processing of the data. Need to be aware of the cloud as we do that. And we've got to be pragmatic. Um, <laughs> I was talking to my dad a while back, and uh, a funny thing happened to both he and I uh, about five years ago. 
is for various reasons, um, I, I was living in a place with a homeowners association, I guess it was about seven years ago, and he was also living in a place with a homeowners association. For various reasons, neither of us had really attended the meetings. And so about the same time, he started attending the meetings where he was living in um, near Colorado Springs, and I started attending the meetings where I was living in the Denver area. And just speaking this really pragmatic language of reason, people were like, what is this magic? And before I knew it, I was the president of the board. And, before, and he came in and he started doing the same thing, just talking like reason. Like, here's the logical way that this works. Here's why we should care, here's what we shouldn't care about. He found he was the president of his board also in about two months. As we bring practical solutions to the table, which we have to, right? We were the underdogs for a really long time in security and we had to be really pragmatic about our solutions. As we bring those to the table now that we're not the underdogs and these issues are in the limelight, they will be appreciated even more. It makes us better security people to understand the privacy aspects of the things that we're doing. And boiling it down also to kind of bite-sized pieces. This is something we excel at as a community. And it's evidenced by how we will go after a single vulnerability and fill an entire room of people to talk about the details of that one vulnerability and how we got there. We're not looking at vulnerability overall in the marketplace when we do that. We're looking at a single issue that we can actually accomplish and take, take on at a technical level. Oh, um, I'm hiring too, right? Resume is welcome. Um, thank you, I appreciate your time. Um, you guys have any questions for me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, tell me what, what you're thinking, Jim. The question there for people was, um, it seems that the solutions that we actually need to enable privacy a lot of times are anything but pragmatic. And he asked me to, to uh, answer that. Um, I, I disagree. I, I think that when, you, when you're looking at these issues, if it seems super not practical, you're looking at too much of the problem at once. And that's what I mean when I say take on bite-sized pieces boiled down to what the actual root cause is uh, or the root causes are of the thing that you're looking at and take one on now and then take another on and take another on. This is a multi-year process. I've been at this for two and a half years in Bing. I can say proudly I've gone through I think three or four major technical architecture additions that were implemented that I now feel pretty okay about some parts of the things that we're doing. Where, where you know, before, maybe I wasn't so okay with it. It's a multi-year process and we have to be patient. All right, thumbs up, answered. Other question? Yes? Okay, so the question is, uh, as you go online, there's some necessity to identify yourself, although the privacy community would say that uh, they would prefer for everyone to remain completely anonymous, but then balance that with we have children masquerading as adults in very adult sites, very adult sorts of things. Gee, I have no idea what you could possibly t be talking about. Porn! Um, and how, as parents, can we reconcile that? And how as a society can we, we reconcile those two points? Excellent question. And I think we're actually looking at two or three different issues with that, right? Uh, one of the first issues that we're looking at is identity. Identity is central to solving the privacy and actually a lot of the security problems around data. 
without positive identity assertion, it is very, very difficult to do that. So this is like, uh, th there was a cookie law that was passed in, uh, or a directive in the EU and uh, England was the first country to pass it and the Netherlands also. Uh, or they, they were the first countries to try and enforce it. And they made this law that said, um, you must ask before you can store cookies on the internet. Okay, ridiculous on two points. One, how are you gonna store the answer to that? In a cookie. Two, <laughs> we're gonna break state on the internet by disallowing all cookies to happen, right? So uh, even, uh, it, it, this is very similar in that in order to achieve the privacy that we're looking for, there has to be some level of assertion of positive identification. Now, that assertion can be different depending on the context that you're looking at. And this is getting much more into the identity than the you know, specific uh, privacy or, or security aspects of it. Uh, but there's a different level of identity that you need to log into your Hotmail account than to go browse a random website. Microsoft needs to understand that you're actually the individual or an individual that has the right credentials to get into the Hotmail account, whereas going to Bing, as an example, you can come completely anonymous if you so desire, or you can give varying levels of authentication depending on the level of service that you want. So that's one part, is identity. The second part is controls. So once we have these positive identity assertions, the controls just simply don't exist. Uh, to be able to, like as a parent, right, this is kind of how I came to this whole problem, understand what my children are doing. Protect them from bad things they don't understand, from evil people who want to do things that are reprehensible and illegal. And, you know, they obviously haven't seen me. They obviously don't know my wife or, you know, they wouldn't desire to do these things to our, our children because they probably value their own lives more than that. But uh, th those, those controls don't exist. And this is actually exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for. I'm not telling you all, here is the solution. I'm saying, we have solutions in this room. We need to be thinking about how we address these problems. Um, thank you, I appreciate the question. Any other questions? Yes. So what's your thoughts on Thoughts on what? Prism. Prism. So I will give you first the official Microsoft line. <laughs> which is, we comply with all legal orders. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means we only comply with legal orders. In Bing, as an example, I get requests from, oh, Members of government, let's say a senator's wife went and had a bender one weekend and got in a car accident with a boy toy in the car. Happens. They come to me, they say, remove this data. Like, no. Right, so that's one side of it. On the other side, we get someone in an official capacity coming to me saying, I'm doing an investigation, give me data about X. So in the first instance, I'd say, show me a legal order. Show me a court order saying I have to remove the data. In the second instance, I'd, sh I'd say, show me the subpoena. Show me the subpoena that gives you access to this data. So either to remove or to distribute data, I require legal orders. I will say on a non super official, although I understand I represent uh, Microsoft because I work for them, I, before I worked at uh, Microsoft, I worked Bell Labs. I was Lucent, I was Avaya, and I'm actually a VoIP engineer by trade. I understand what it means to process voice. If the NSA were actually capturing all these phone calls, recording and processing them, I think the processing that went on there would be so enormous that um, the heat coming off the processors would be viewable from space. And, I, and that's not an exaggeration. It would actually change ecologies with the amount of heat that was being produced by these processors. Right? It, it's, 
technically rather infeasible, some of the lengths that are said to be going to. But on the other hand, if the NSA is not getting copies of all of the international phone calls that go on from the United States or to the United States, what the hell are we paying them for? Isn't that their job? Right. What's that? They're contributing, there you go, global warming, global warning. Uh, and, and I can tell you actually, running a data center is a very expensive operation. Um, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, so we have that, you know, approaching an exobyte of data, and we've got hundreds of thousands of servers just working on Bing. Um, understanding the amount of heat that we're actually dealing with there, the amount of power that we're actually dealing with, to do the things that are being asserted that the NSA is doing, um, would have to be much, 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 much larger by like an order of magnitude or two. And yeah, I think it would be, it would be pretty noticeable. Now, they're, they're doing some things, but legal order, that's uh, from Microsoft, from Google, from everybody, that's what you're hearing. We require legal order. And it's what Obama is saying, it's what the senators are saying, they're saying these are legal programs. Other questions? Yes, way in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so very good question. The question is um, how, we've been talking about customers, but what about inside a corporation? How do we keep uh, you know, employee A from getting access to resource B? Uh, the joke of was uh, you know, clearly the NSA isn't very good at that, uh, well played. Um, I, I hear they might have an opening here in Hawaii, right? Uh, <laughs> And uh, th that's actually a very, very good question. So I was having another conversation yesterday and somebody pause, posed this as a question uh, to me in a different kind of way. And they said, it would seem to me that, work that living in the cloud, because that's the example I'm gonna use, that's where I live and spend my time is building the cloud, that as a consumer in the cloud, I'm going to by default get, a, for a level of security, the same level as the person who requires the maximum level of security that's your customer. And that's true. So we have lots of controls, I can tell you, in place. Um, in Bing, we go out and we copy the internet, right? We're not dealing with a ton of intellectual property there that's not already public domain. But Office 365, on the other hand, holds the intellectual property of lots of other companies. And there's lots of controls in place to keep employee A from seeing things about company B or keeping company B from seeing things about, oh, let's say DOD company C. Right? There's a lot of controls in place, and it is one of the areas that we focus on. Um, I spend almost as much time in my privacy role in Bing keeping other internal partners out of the data as I do making sure that we build things the right way. And we only allow those accesses if we have that consent, and we have that notice, and we have the, um, the legal right and ability to share the data in those ways. And there, there's a lot of ways that we can. There's a lot of ways that we do but there's other ways that we just don't. Other questions? All right, thank you very much and I appreciate uh, your time.